Hi guys, so welcome to our next lesson on the Gaelic Revival. Today we're going to be looking at the GAA and the role of sports in the revival of Gaelic culture that happened at the end of the 1800s. Okay, so we're going to be looking at the history of the GAA itself, when it was set up, some of the problems it may be faced, and most especially the influence it's had on the modern world in Ireland, which is quite significant. So just to start off, um, it's important to kind of have a good appreciation of and a good knowledge of how your own culture affects you as a person or has affected your life. And things like the GAA, um, even if we are, you're not particularly involved in the Gaelic sports, even if it's something you haven't played personally, the GAA is very much part of life in Ireland and it We've all had different experiences with it. Maybe the different levels. Some people may be very involved. Maybe you know have been on teams, have been gone to competitions, watched the matches regularly, have been to the All Ireland, have been into Crow Park, have done all of that and really really engaged with it. Some people may have much lower levels of engagement with it. You know, but uh, you might simply have you know known, been taught how to use a hurl when you were in primary school, or you might have. Uh, just watched a few matches here and there. You might have been to the museum. You might just have had someone in your family who talks about it and you know uh, speaks to you about it. Okay, but everyone has had some kind of influence with it. We all know what the GAA sports are. We all know the base. You know, most of us would know the basic rules. We've all had some kind of engagement with it in our lives. So what I want you to do is take a few minutes and think about that. Okay, and think about how it has been involved in your life. How where have you come across it? It may not. You know, when has it? You know influenced you in some way okay so i want you to answer these questions on the board how has ga effect ga affected your life have you watched a match before uh, did you learn the games as a child so did you learn some of the rules of uh, gaelic football or hurling uh, have you played the sports on a team you know maybe some of you play camogie some of you play hurling some of you play football um, and do you have a hurl or a gaelic football at home you know i know I've always had just in my house at home has just always been a hurl there. I'm not particularly sporty kind of person, you know. I don't play hurling, but there's always been a hurl around. Okay, so just you know to have a think about that. I mean, there's a few pictures there. You know, do you know these uh, trophies? You know, do you know where that? Uh, do you recognise kind of the image in the pictures? Right. So just have a think about GA in your life for a few minutes, and just in your head, or maybe you know, jot down one or two notes on each of those questions. Okay, so look at the point of this is just really to make everyone understand that you know if you're living in Ireland, the GAA has been involved in our lives. Okay? It doesn't matter whether you're a sporty person or not. It doesn't matter if you play the games. We've all come across it. Okay, it may not be a huge influence in your life, but it's definitely something that comes across. And because of this, it becomes some part of a part of national identity. We see the GAA, the Gaelic sports. You know, especially when we go abroad, maybe we don't think about them all the time when we're in Ireland. And really, you don't usually tend to think about your own cultural identity if you're living in the country of that culture. But when we go abroad, Irish people tend to think or to mention the sports a lot more. There's a lot of pride around the sports that Ireland has maintained this culture. There's a lot of pride around the complexity of the sport. You know, hurling is the fastest ball uh, pitch ball game on, on in the world. Um, there's a Crow Park is an absolutely massive stadium. Right? So there's a lot being coming from the Gaelic sports to offer to our identity. Okay. So for today, what we're mainly looking at doing is thinking about the role of GAA in Irish life. We want to think about the influence of Irish sports on Irish identity. And we want to just have a good knowledge of the story of the GAA. What is the history? You know, where did it come from? When was it set up? Things like that. Okay. Now to start off with, we're going to look at the history of the GAA. Now most of this information is in your booklet. So if you scroll down, you're going past the other two uh, topics we've talked about. So you're going to scroll past um, the Gaelic League, past the Literary Revival, and then it's down, I think, on page four of booklet and um, just two pages on GA this is a very significant aspect of the Irish cultural revival the Gaelic revival so a few questions I'm going to talk about this now in a few minutes you can use a booklet as well all this information should be in the booklet 
Um, what I want to know is this man in the picture, who is this man in the picture? When was the GAA founded? Where was it founded? What did GAA do to help make it popular and reach a wide audience? Okay, it spread very quickly. What did it do to help that? And what problems did the GAA face in its early years? We're looking at the first few decades of its existence. Okay, so the history of GAA. Um, so GAA was set up um, in, sorry, I have 1884 written down here, but I have a feeling that that is incorrect. It took me two seconds, I'm just going to double check that. But it was founded by a man named Michael Cusack. That's a man in the picture here. Um, Cusack was a avid sports fan and played the Gaelic sports throughout his life. Um, he's supposedly quite a talented sports player. Um, so I'm just doing just checking this research. Oh yeah, 1884. Sorry. So yeah, so it was founded in 1884 by Cusack and a number of other men. They were they held a meeting in Turles in County Tipperary. There was only seven people at this first meeting. Um, basically, what they were trying to do is bring back these sports that they love. Over the course of the 1800s, the English sports, so uh, soccer, uh, cricket, tennis, these sport they have been coming be, been becoming much more popular around Ireland. Um, whilst the GAA sports or the Gaelic sports were losing popularity, and so these uh, people who got together, these men who got together, wanted to change this. They wanted to bring people back to the Irish sports. The a number of issues that sports faced before the foundation of GA were things like lack of organisation. There was no set rules that governed the sport across the country, and sports could change quite significantly. The rules could change quite significantly from county to county, um, just because these were the local people who were playing by their own rules. So GA sought to establish set rules, you know, uh, rules that would work across the entire. Uh, country, you know, just to the extent that the amount of players even on a team wasn't consistent in different counties. Um, oftentimes, there's reports of, you know, huge numbers of players being on teams and not really being regulated at all. <clears throat> so they brought a bit of stability to it, a bit of a organisation. This is important just to make the games fair and make them interesting and, you know, help people to understand across the country what was going on. Um, they saw a lot of quick success and really within six months they had local clubs established all over the country. All right? So as soon as people had the opportunity for a organisation that was offering them access to the, to the Gaelic sports, people really grabbed it and kind of ran with it and really enjoyed it. Now they did make a few um, controversial decisions in the early days. So in order to make sure that the Gaelic sports, in order to try and promote the Gaelic sports over the English sports, a rule was made that for people who are members of the GA, they are not expected to play the other any non-Gaelic sports competitively. And this rule lasted for a long time, I think it was the uh, 1950s and 1970s when it was removed, that is in your booklet of information. But they really, so they spread out quickly and they ensured that people had a bit more, had quite a lot of loyalty to their to the Gaelic sports by saying, you know, if you want to be involved in this, you should be totally committed to this and not be playing sports from different countries. They also offered, you know, when they spread out, um, the English sports, while they were popular, were often more accessible to people of a higher social class. You know, the clubs really kind of focused on the higher class people, the people who had a bit more money. So when the GAA came, they really wanted to make sure that it was a sport that was accessible to everyone. And so they encouraged people of all sorts of classes, people from poor backgrounds and people from more wealthy backgrounds to become involved and to play the games. And this helped them create a sense of community around the sports. You know, when you went to a GAA club, you were, it doesn't matter what your social background was, it was that you were there to enjoy the sport. And it caused, you know, a much better, built up a very good community around this. And because they had so many clubs and they were building this community, it just uh, increased the popularity. Because they standardised the rules as well, they were able to start organising um, competitions, you know, across the counties, across the country and whole, as a whole. And just, you know, just sense competition. People love competition, so it's really going to intrigue people. Um, 
Now, things didn't go 100% to plan. You know, there was a few hiccups and a few issues along the beginning. So, as the GAA naturally drew people who were nationalistic in their politics, people who believed in Irish nationalism, the IRB, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which we've talked about before, you know, this uh, paramilitary, this military secret group towards Irish nationalism, saw the GAA as kind of a recruitment ground for troops, for soldiers, for their cause. Because, you know, there was a lot of the people who were involved were nationalistic, they were young, they were fit, they were healthy. It's exactly what you want in a soldier. So the IRB kind of infiltrated the GAA and this caused some um, disagreement in the upper ranks of the GAA. Whilst a lot of people would have been supportive of the ideas behind the IRB, not everyone would have been totally committed to their methods. And so it was a lot of you know, this kind of puts things, slows things down, slows down the enthusiasm. There's a worry there now. People are not 100% committed if they think that their organization is helping to promote violence. And, you know, there's a bit of wariness around continuing, around really developing this hugely. There's also, and this is, uh, we're going to link back to uh, political history, sort of parliamentary figures that we looked at earlier in the year. And we looked at, um, Charles Stuart Parnell. Now, you may remember that Charles Stuart Parnell faced a few controversies in his life, and one of them being that he was in a relationship with a married woman, Kitty O'Shea. Um, and I mentioned that this, uh, when Kitty O'Shea was getting, divorced, her husband was divorcing her, Parnell got dragged into the court of proceedings, and this was a huge, huge controversy for the time. And people were really, you know, shocked by this, and it caused Parnell basically his career to a large extent. This O'Shea divorce scandal also divided GAA because the leadership divided in terms of their support for Parnell or their um, being against Parnell, right? Okay? Um, and because certain members agreed with Parnell, and you know, because of just this. Um, this argument within the organization, the GAA lost a lot of its popularity and reputation <clears throat> um, in the early 1980s uh, as a result of this. Okay? You know, this was a, it, it's strange to understand it now, but this divorce scandal really affected a lot of Irish life and the loyalties to two people involved in this really, you know, we had a huge influence. Um, now, there was a lot of positive things going on as well. There was strong links formed between GAA and things like um, the Gaelic League, the different organisations being involved in promoting of Irish culture. You know, GAA was not just uh, solely about sport at times. You know, they were they wanted to promote all aspects of Irish culture. So, you know, they were interested in helping out with the Gaelic League with the different with dancing with the culture with the language with all different aspects of that. And there was definitely strong links. Uh, forged between the two in order to promote each other's um, well-being, in, in, promote each other's interests. One of the greatest uh, probably successes was uh, the buying of Crow Park and development of a huge stadium there. Now, the stadium at the time would not have been the stadium that we now know. You know, our the stadium there now holds eighty thousand people. It's an absolutely massive stadium. The stadium that was that they bought at the time was nowhere near that. But it's still the same ground, you know, it's still the same area. And this was a very, very important part of being able to hold, you know, inter county and countrywide competition and having a place to organise and gather people. And it would actually become very important. Uh, as a, you know, some of you will know the story of um, Bloody Sunday at um, the GA at, that happened at Grow Park um, later in the Irish War of Independence. But that's something we'll get onto at a later date. Okay, so I'm going to suggest, I talked quite a bit there, and all this information is in the booklet as well, I'm going to suggest you pause here and answer those five questions that are in front of you there. Okay, so this, I'm going to be a bit quicker here now, and you might want to, you know, we will go back over this and we'll discuss this um, after the midterm in a bit more detail. I want to know uh, here, how does GA... Uh, Create, I should say, create actually a sense of belonging for the Irish diaspora. 
Uh, do you think the GAA has a strong influence in modern Ireland? And why might the GAA be considered an important part of Irish identity? So again, there's some more information on this in the uh, booklet. You know, things you might want to think about here is that, you know, we have um, teams from the diaspora involved in the All-Ireland. Okay, you know, there's a London team involved in the All-Ireland. I think there's a New York team. I'm not, <laughs> so I'm not um, overly versed on the running of the GA, but there are a number of um, countries where there are cities where there's a huge Irish uh, tradition sending teams to the GA. So these uh, these sports have reached out outside of the island. We have a sense of, you know, this is something that is ours. Just like America has a few sports of their own, you know, they have American football, they have baseball. When you go to Australia, they have Aussie rules football. Ireland has these very strong cultural sports and they're really something to be very proud of and are very well organized. You know, they draw huge crowds. And, you know, if you look at Crow Park and even the just the entire country on All Ireland Sunday, the interest in these sports is absolutely immense. Um, there's definitely a strong influence there. I think most people will learn the sports in their uh, when in school, when in primary school. You know, it's definitely it permeates a lot of different aspects of Irish society, and for this reason, it can be considered quite important part of Irish identity. It's something that people have to be proud of. It's something that's purely Irish. Um, it's something that's very ancient, and so it's a, it's a direct link back to ancient Irish, uh, very old, much older Irish culture. So there's a lot there to be proud of, you know, you see people, once people, uh, when people move abroad, they maybe have, you know, expressed this a bit more, but there's a definite pride around these um, sports. So again, there's a bit more detail about these questions maybe in the booklet, but this is somewhat of a personal opinion as well, and your own experiences. So task, next task for today is to answer these questions, submit them to, just so we're ready for discussion. So what you need to submit today are the questions there on the history of the GAA and then the questions here on GAA in the world today and we will discuss this in a bit more detail later on. Okay, I'm going to leave it there guys because I'm conscious of the time so thanks for watching and uh, if you have any questions just email me and let me know.